Stopping the next mascot or Opal Towers? Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian Heiser here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Grab your stein of coffee and I'd like to talk about some suggestions for how we could stop the next, next mascot or Opal Towers disaster. Now, they're not entirely alone. What I have here is what I sadly call the Triangle of Fail, where you can see just all buildings that have had construction issues that I started tracking, particularly from Sugar Cube to Mascot and Zetland buildings here down, you know, in southern or southernish Sydney, Sydney, central Sydney would call it. Well, you know, that's really the central, but you know what I mean. This is where all the industrial development happened and all the, you know, polluted water is now leaching towards Botany Bay. But, you know, construction issues are a common thing at the moment and they're exacerbating. They're exacerbating just uh, people's confidence in this sector. I would be, I'm surprised that people are paying so much they are for apartments but probably because of my exposure to construction, everyone. Now, what I wanted to talk about today are a few things. It all, it all comes back to, to be honest, a thesis that my wife wrote called The Towering Inferno, and she hasn't actually watched the movie, but she named it after the movie. Rachel's thesis was about just the implications of, it, it ended up evolving into the implications of disasters on fire legisla legislation and how that affected designs, how that influenced designs, how that restricted designs. I think it came about a project that she was working on in a firm down the Gold Coast as a student. There, there was an issue with just the way the plasterboard was lapped or laid or you know joined from one wall to another so the smoke wall wouldn't make the requirements and that got her quite interested into why they have all these rules and these other issues that are coming in in the legislation. And in her thesis, she discovered probably the best, frankly, the best part of her thesis was just going through the, the literature and the history of fire legislation and how one disaster after another occurred. And then that is what led to legislation coming in. So it's not the government coming in and, and protecting everyone. It's reactionary. It is very reactionary. Every piece of legislation that you have with regards to fire safety and building safety is usually the result that people died. This image here shows you strategies for <laughs> patents for evacuating buildings. I mean, there you go, a parachute with rubber shoes, elastic sole overshoes. What do you think? Do you think that patent would, would work, <laughs> guys? Here's another one, a rope type fire escape. One of the issues in New York is because they had the, the steel fire escapes coming out of the building, people would melt to them. So this is just showing how a lot of this legislation that we have is reactionary. It's coming after the fact. So I would argue that all the people that are calling for government intervention and more government regulation, it's not going to protect you now or for what's happened in the past. We need to educate the market and the public to demand more from the product, from the developers, from the builders, from the people making these buildings and just re you know, refuse or turn away or reduce the amount they're paying they're willing to pay because they understand if they're getting a dodgy deal perhaps that's naive on my part but i still think moving forward that is the strategy that we need to take for a better better built outcome for everyone now here we have the shergold weir report everyone this, this was a report completed years ago and i went through the entire report you can actually listen to it like a podcast if you really want to but i went through the whole report this is before before Opal. This is years before that. All the issues in the construction sector had been highlighted and had been identified. Now, one of the issues with regards to uh, apartment construction is that the sector was hugely overheated. And you can see here, this is just foreign investment flooding in back in the day in 14, 15, 16, 17. That overheated the market. And we had a huge, huge amount of just GDP propped up by this. This is a quote from Matt Berry. In 2016, 67% of the GDP came from Sydney and Melbourne. Now, a small area from the Sydney CBD to Macquarie Park was in the middle of a housing boom alone contributed to 24% of the entire GDP growth for 2016. Just this one area. This is my worry with the home builder that once again, we will have an overheating of the housing market, everyone. But here's the thing. This is more suggestions, solutions, 
uh, for government intervention that still some of them still haven't manifested all these politicians are just going to be slow and they're going to take their time so there's two things two su suggestions that i want to put forward that i think will make a uh, well could solve a lot of these issues now the first one is multi-certification and this is where you know to try and address some of the construction industry production and this is an older video that i've done in the past and we will just jump to florian back in time solving corruption in the construction industry let's look at a solution hello everyone i'm florian heiser and welcome to a new episode and the beginning of a new series of episodes at Heiser Says. I want to call it Solutions and I want to address particular issues on a range of topics that I discuss, but from the perspective of a solution, how to solve the problem. Because I know a lot of people enjoy watching my content for you know, interesting takes on a variety of things, criticism of what we're receiving in the news, contrarian opinion, and just gray-haired cynicism from a middle-aged father. But I'd also like to start talking and addressing solutions. And often positive things or ways to address problems can get lost in a lot of the noise, particularly if people are worried. So I'm going to try and do this series, you know, solutions to different issues and you know, get it out there to get people to discuss. Now, I'd like you please to share this content, share this channel and get these ideas out there so we can spread solutions to a lot of the problems that we are facing. We don't all need to glue ourselves to the road to discuss ideas. You know, internet is a fantastic medium. We can talk to people all over the world and get ideas out. So on this first episode, probably even called a pilot of solutions, I want to go back to a video I previously did that didn't get much attention, probably because of the way I titled it, and look at the dual or two certification system a way of addressing a lot of the corruption and issues that we're finding in the construction industry throughout the entire country here in australia without getting the state to step up i i don't know i'm just too cynical more legislation doesn't seem to be the solution guys because we already have it so please I'll, we'll jump back to another foreign in the past and have a look at this previous episode. And now the first of solutions, if you have any suggestions of other episodes or topics you'd like me to discuss, and I'm going to experiment with some different approaches to do it. It may, you know, I can see a combination of pre-recorded things and live episodes and looking at doing, you know, the drawing on my tablet to argument mapping and things like that. So if you have any suggestions, please pop me an email, leave a comment or, you know, send it to me on the dis uh, discord board for ideas solutions and we can bring it all together and get it out there so guys thank you for joining me please like share and subscribe and i will hand over to previous florian take care hello everyone florian heiser here and welcome to another episode of heiser says now i've been going through a lot of issues in new south wales and around australia with our construction sector particularly the loss in confidence that consumers have in development in apartment living and the buildings that we have around understandably because of all of the construction issues that we're seeing again and again and again now one solution is to re-nationalize the building certification process and get the state to control that part of the process i thought let's look at some alternatives and i had one viewer call me up and make a suggestion and i thought we'd look at that and discuss that today and i'd like to call that the dual certifier system where instead of having one certifier you, we have multiple ones and this can be done right now by any developer who chooses to take on that responsibility to ensure their project going forward is going to be rigorous and have a point of difference to the others i'd like to see this as really a market driven approach to find a solution to what we're having it looks like you've got a few rogue operators because how many of the certifiers in New South Wales repeatedly repeatedly had one faulty approval after another to the point where you've had people living for 10 years in a building on just an interim certificate okay there's an example and you know so that's I thought we'd do a bit of sketching and just uh, theory craft theory craft some ideas about how this might work to get a dialogue going and you know 
leave your feedback in the comments guys if you think this is just pipe dreams but i thought we'd have a look at it so i've got my my surface here and what we'll do is first we'll just have a look at imagine this is your project okay going on from the start of the project to the completion of the project now you've got a few points on there this is a, a timeline and you've got the first one here which is your da we'll call that development approval and then here you've got construction approval now these are two significant milestones in the project and then finally you've got another one well not finally but one that's quite important is the certificate of occupancy or the certificate of classification you know those type of things that's when you occupy so the da that's when you get development approval from the council that means the council will you'll have all your drawings and you get a set of documents from the, that you'll prepare which have your drawings and everything to a development ac application point of view or a level of detail and council will, will prepare documents and have conditions on those that you need to abide by okay and the certifier they are responsible for making sure that you abide by those conditions then you have construction approval and this is where the certifier will give you building approval what's called will give you building approval to proceed with the documentation of the job it's almost like my uh, my screen is running out of ink i think it's playing up a little bit so you've got building approval this is where the certifier will approve give you a certificate or approval to proceed will stamp the drawings and those are the construction drawings that you have to build that you have to build now they need to conform very closely with the da they need to meet the, the requirements of the ba the da that the these developer or the certified in the council have have recommended in here so the council has said what is required of the da the uh, the ba drawings the construction drawings need to achieve those requirements and meet these you know tick off these issues so the certifier has to ensure that it meets the da requirements then the ba also has to specify all of the building code requirements so the B building code of australia or the ncc bca or ncc so that's you know the big book and hang on we'll i'll get uh, come on so here you go here's the all, last one you can get it free online now this is the 2016 version you know they're fun to read put you to sleep in an instant so that's really when the certifier has to make sure that your ba documents comply with those requirements and there's all the other consultants and things that come in and then you have the certificate of classification certificate of occupancy depending on what state you're in that's when you occupy the building that's when you're allowed to occupy the building when it's deemed to be practically complete okay so the issue arises when you have only one certifier doing the process so when you only have one the issue is that there is a potential for a conflict of interest arising so say you've got one certifier here you know, here and he's just stamping off everything because he's working with the same people again and again and again so what we would do is hang on i've got to just sort something out okay i think i fixed that issue so what we've got is we've got a situation where you've got three stages in the project the development application stage the construction documentation or building approval stage and then you've got your certificate of classification stage now what we'll do is the proposal is that we move from a system where you just have one developer a uh, one certifier here approving everything okay and he's hired by the builder and that's has the potential for a conflict of interest that can arise because of repeat work and we've just seen you, know, you can't tell me that it doesn't happen we've seen it happen in the industry in the industry so what i'd propose is the dual certification system so you've got two certifiers and they can both be you know in the market or you could have a lottery that applies number two you know randomly from the profession uh this the method of picking that one is is um irrelevant really for this argument but you've got all the different issues that the certifiers check comply make decisions on because we don't want our building code to lose its flexibility okay that, that's the one thing that you, that we need to realize like this document the flexibility in 
in this huge document. And I got the I got the current one back there, but the flexibility in the building code is fantastic. Australia, in some ways, really is. We don't want one that's purely prescriptive because that will destroy a few competitive advantages or just innovation that we can have, uh, which is which is a bit worrying. So the idea is you've got two certifiers on every job. Maybe we say it's just jobs at a certain value, but here's the thing: that say there's one decision here, they have to agree to that to each decision and if we go back up oh, no so it has to rectify and they need to reach a consensus on it or if there's one here and he's going no and they disagree they can't reach a, reach a consensus that's when you go to a third certifier to review and make the final call now you think oh florian but this is so much more paperwork it's so much more expense but from a project, I can tell you right now, the certifiers portion of the fees of a multi-million dollar project isn't that significant. Guys, we're not talking that large an amount in the old grand scheme of things. But this is in a way, this is a way that you could market your project in such a way that, you know, such and such development here, you know, we're ensuring, you know, dual certification to make sure there's no risk of dodgy deals we've got the right people on the job you know we've, we've invested in, in professionals you know twice the checks twice the review twice the compliance twice the insurance that you could chase if the worst happens so you know the, i would argue the market could respond to this this doesn't this is a completely stateless solution you don't really need the government to dictate an approach like this this can be done just with you know what's currently in place the professionals that we currently have and it's going to really be a lot harder to get two dodgy operators two dodgy do i know you'd want to make a rule that it's not people in the same company or you'd want to advertise that it's not people in the same company you're getting another professional to check the work and this is just one part of the process it's to deal with these rogue operators that are in the certification game that are being taken advantage of and then what you need to do the next step is to get the market involved, to get average mum and dad who are looking at buying an apartment or looking at buying an investment property, turning this into a branding in such a way. Like, you know, you've got the Heart Foundation brand, you've got this brand, this brand, you know, the dual certification stamp of approval, you know, addressing the rogue operators. We need to get the marketing guys onto it. But, you know, for a, a, a small increase in cost in the project, you can provide additional peace of mind to people. We can avoid getting the government to mandate it because this could still be done right now. You know, there's nothing stopping. There is nothing stopping a developer doing this. There's nothing stopping the you know certification industry, their professional bodies promoting this as an approach to deal with the rogue operators. And sure, people will just say, oh, they want to make double the money, yada, yada, yada. I'm sure if you had two, two guys, you know, working it, they could work something out. It could be like a, an extra set of eyes. Another, an, an engineer's review. You'd, it would be easier to do your site inspections when you've got two, you know, you obviously want them going out both at the same time. But there you go. So that is an idea, a suggestion. So I'd like to open it up to the comments. What do you think? Do you think this is a pipe dream? And do you think it could work? The dual certification, you know, dual certifiers as a way of dealing with it. Thank you, Pass Florian. I hope you all enjoyed that. Now, with that perspective put forward, or that idea put forward, there's another suggestion I would like to, uh, well, let everyone know about. This is the way buildings are procured. And when I say procured, it's how they are built. And, well, the contractual process that goes through, it, it's not as easy as, as some people realize. There's different approaches and different legal relationships that occur when you're, well, when you're procuring a building. You can use the more traditional method where you've got the architect, then the architect negotiates between, acts as an impartial professional third party between the, the client and the builder and makes judgment calls on that. That's the, the traditional procurement method. That's falling out of favor because, well, it costs more. It takes more time and hopefully it assures quality. But another approach is design and construct where everyone 
is put under the builder and you make it all the builder's responsibility. I can see, I can appreciate how that can be very beneficial. And in certain, certain circumstances, it can be very appealing to the developer or people procuring buildings. But there are issues with that. So in this next video, I put the question forward, was it design and construct that failed Opal Tower? And introduce the, the whole mess of legal relationships to everyone so you can be aware of it. Let's go back to that, Florian, and have a look now. The exciting world of building procurement. Let's have a look. Good evening, everyone. I'm Florian Heiser with my Stein of coffee again and just recovering after essentially hitting send on a deadline. So big project. I've been killing myself and so has Rachel for the last week. And all of a sudden to celebrate, my NBN gets cut off. <laughs> Apparently they're doing maintenance works until the 22nd of this month. So six day window and it's, it's only meant to be for what, three hours and it's been all day. So it's going to be interesting seeing how I can produce content for you today oh, and uh, for the rest of the week. So, you know, my quality may decrease as in I may do the dodgiest uh, compression possible just to upload it over my phone. So I thought today we would have a look at building procurement. Now, I've mentioned this a few times before. Now, everyone's talking about certification, registration of professionals, the, the privatization of certifiers, corruption in local authorities. You know, you, you look at um, at Martin North and, and in the interests of the people, and they've got some really good talks there, but I haven't really heard anyone talking about, to a much extent, about procurement. And I've mentioned that in previous videos and people have asked, what do I mean by procurement? And I thought tonight we would have a look at just two examples and two case study documents prepared by the Office of the Victorian Government Architect, the OVGA. Oh, VGA. You know, thumbs up for all the old gamers that appreciate going to 256 graphics. You know, thumbs up. But <laughs> back, back to this. So the Office of the Government, or the Office of the Victorian Government Architect, essentially they're a government employee and, and their main uh, focus is to represent design or design value or architectural value. I won't go into any great detail because I've worked for the Office of the Government Architect up here and I found, uh, you know, I, I guess when you appreciate the bureaucracy of the public service and how much time they spin their wheels and how badly they do things, you can appreciate why they need a professional in there to kind of steer them, steer them correctly. And these two documents, and there's a whole series of them, are prepared by the office for government use. The first one is just talking about procurement case studies, traditional construction only. And I thought we'd go through these case studies, even though they're, they're aimed for government, they're applicable to every type of project and it's good to give people an understanding of what I actually mean about procurement. Now we're going to look at just two today. We'll look at traditional, the old fashioned way, and then we'll also look at design and construct. And the reason we're looking at design and construct is because design and construct let me just uh, zoom in here nicely design and construct is what was used on opal and is what is used more and more common on projects okay it's kind of finance condition here of projects for design and construct the institute of architects in melbourne had to get their building built with a design and construct contract because the finance sector the banks insisted on it Okay, so there's a, a whole lot here to do with this and it all interweaves to each other and it has different risks. So everyone get your, your stein of coffee ready. Cheers and let's have a look at the traditional construct only form of procurement. Okay, so traditional building procurement is based upon full lump sum contracts. Under these commonly used forms of contract, the architect is engaged directly by government or the developer to undertake all stages of the design process and act as superintendent in administering the client's separate contract with the builder. Okay, so you've got here, you've got the client, which is the government, you've got their design champion, and I'm assuming that's the person internal to, to the government that's, you know, driving the design or the champion. Makes sense. 
and they've got the the design team here and the you know the, there's a contractual relationship between the client which is the governor the developer and the design team which is the architect the engineers and all these other people under here and the client also has a separate contract with the builder and that's managed by the design team managed by the architect there so just have a look at the, these relationships here because that's really important so action to benefit good design and this is coming from the office of the architect so their emphasis is on good design a clear design intent and brief explaining the design philosophy as part of the tender documents will help protect the design quality now this means when you're going to tender now tender means when, when you've got all your documents done all your documents done in this process your drawings schedule specification all the engineering calculations double checked everything you bind it up into a big document and then you either invite several builders or you have a public tender where they all you know get that and then they look through it and they put a price in essentially and then you compare them make sure they're all the same and do an assessment and move forward from there so here this is what they're explaining you should have in this document set a well-defined scope of works and comprehensive documentation comprehensive documentation are very thorough to minimize variations to the contract price okay now variations these are say you've got incomplete information in the documentation and you need to make a you know you need to add a dish or there's something's going to take extra time there's, there's a few ones there's variations that can result from a mistake from information maybe you didn't get in time maybe you were getting a particular type of equipment in and then once you received the information about it after you'd already gone to tender it was a different size slightly to what you'd allowed for so you have to massage that or it could be a latent condition it could, maybe there was something that you, you couldn't get access to you couldn't open something up you couldn't dig underneath a, a certain thing until you actually went to construction so you put a you know a block of money aside from there and said builder please allow that but then there's a variation to that so it, you know they go up and down you either sometimes you give money to the builder for a variation sometimes you take money back maybe they find a savings but the idea with this type of procurement is that you minimize the variation so you've got solid thorough documentation so the builder knows exactly what they're doing careful selection of the design team to ensure requisite design expertise in addition to capacity and experience okay so you want a good team establish appropriate contingencies so even when you have a contract price on a project you need to have a contingency sum and that's an additional bucket of money that isn't part of the contract it may be allowed for your budget but it's an additional bucket of money you would need for unexpected things because remember these buildings are not like mass-produced vehicles even the mass-produced buildings are not mass-produced as in well they are but they don't get the same benefits from a factory production as a vehicle does so they're they're one-off art pieces in a way and i know that's going to sound airy fairy but they're unique to the site the unique combination of skills they're a unique place in time so they can be unique compl complexities and you know unknown circumstances happen you need some money in the kitty for it so engage design advice from the architect to assist with design quality management in brief and contractual development okay well it's architectural spin but they want to you know, put the architect forward because often this doesn't happen remember this is for government this is telling government employees what to do and some of them aren't doing this the client understands the impartial role of the architect and their expert advice independent of the builder now this is very important impartial role of the architect and the expert advice independent of the builder okay so the architect here is independent of the builder we manage the contract this relationship here we act as the superintendent and manage it give make judgment calls on it on that relationship but it's independent from the builder okay so i'll highlight that again because that's really one of the most important things out of all of this procurement stuff we're talking about ensure the provision for independent design advice at key project milestones this may include advice from a design quality team or design review at the end of schematic design or design development that's more well just to do their thorough documentation and due diligence in the government which is tough when they have to get stuff out really really quick I know we had a job out at Ipswich little police station and it had to get built by a certain time frame to meet an election promise it did happened but it was sitting there empty the politicians didn't care 
So this is the, procure, the traditional procurement process. So the architect is independent of the builder. There's a contractual relationship between the client and the builder, and you want thorough documentation to minimize variation, get a decent contract price, and have, you know, have a good, a good progress, good team. You can see here, you've got the builder, and under them, they've got their subbies, their subcontractors. Now, a subcontractor is, you know, maybe they have their own architectural expertise for particular things, Maybe they could be other consultants, you know, over here, or it would be, you know, a Sparky. It would be a sign manufacturer. You know, it would be a carpenter, a jippy, a concrete supplier, you know, all the trades people. That's what the subcontractors are underneath the builder. They work under there. Often you'll hear where builders go under, it's all the subbies that don't get paid. One thing that, that is what you try to do to the best of your abilities as the superintendent administering a contract like this, when see the builder every month, they'll send you a little, little claim for dollar signs. They'll ask you for money and you have to go and assess that the claims that they've put forward to you, are uh, they're not asking for too much money. You know, they're not asking for more money than work has been completed because the concern is what if they're asking for, you know, 10% more just to bank it up or to spend that on another job that they're running in trouble in. You don't want to, you don't want the builder to use up all their money and still have 20% of the work to, to do. So you need to assess that. And you also want to make sure that he has paid his subcontractors because often the scary thing is when the subbies, and I've been a subby when they won't get paid for like 90 days for 120 days and the builder's getting paid all the time, every month on the dot. So you want to make sure and often you'll get stat decks signed, but it's come out in, in uh, recent court cases where, you know, the director signed a stat deck and it meant absolutely nothing. A stat deck saying that they'd paid all the subbies and the, the judge said, no, well, it's, it's unreasonable to expect you to be over all operations of your business. So I don't know why they didn't go in as in breach of the, the oaths act, but there you go. They're, they're not really worth the paper they printed on, sadly. But that's that's the thing there is making sure the subbies are paid. So a, a bit of a tangent there, but that's traditional construction, and that's what you'd use on traditionally on all projects, really, or projects of a certain value, where you wanted to ensure design quality, where you wanted to have a, a decent contract price, minimize the variations, but you had to do it properly. You couldn't cut corners. It, it took time. There were steps to go through the process. So another type of procurement is design and construct. So I'm going to have a coffee. Now I'm emphasizing this because it's a very common form of procurement with a lot of projects and there are some issues involved in it. Oh, hang on. Wait, we'll go back here. Okay, we've got a, a case study here of the school. So we'll go through the summary of each one and then we'll look at the case studies. So the procurement method of design and construction is where the client enters into a single contract with a construction company that provides both the design and construction. Okay, they're providing both design and construction. The design services are often subcontracted to a team of designers dependent on the requirements of the tender. So you've got, you know, over here, over here, the design team over here with a relationship to the client now you've got the design team down here with a relationship to the builder. The client tenders a project brief and each tenderer prepares a preliminary design and basic indication, basic indication of the time and cost needed to complete the project. Often, and this is just from my own experience, often you'll be expected as an architect to do that design for free as part of a tender team, put a, a design together in for free just to get a chance to win the job. And, you know, we, uh, sometimes you do that. You gotta, you gotta, you know, you do favors for people, but it can get tough if you have, a, you know, six months of them and the builder you're working with doesn't win any of them. Or we had a job where they didn't get the tender and we spent hours, I had like six people working on this tender submission for indigenous housing. They didn't get in on time. You know, that made you really happy. So the contractor builder engages their preferred design team to undertake the design work and tenders a price for the delivery of that design and its construction costs. So the builder, you know, the client is engaged with the builder. So here's the client. 
they've got a relationship with the builder. They don't actually have a relationship with the design team at all. The design team, I would say, no, 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 you're, they're treated more like a subcontractor. They're not up here. They're down here. Okay, no matter what, what you think. You know, this was written by architects, so. When all tenderers have been received, the client or client's representative and the client's quantity surveyor will review and select a proposal best suited to the client's requirements. That, yeah, that, I mean, that's, I'm some developers will use a QS, all smart ones will. A guaranteed maximum price is negotiated between the contractor and the client based on the client's brief. Okay, guaranteed maximum price. So just remember that. If you've got a fixed maximum that you can go to, if uh, the builder finds savings, who's going to get those savings? In our other example here, where you had you know this type of relationship, and I'll tidy this up a bit more, we had this type of relationship. Say the builder says, oh, Florian, I found this great product that can give, you know, do everything you want and is 10% cheaper. Or, you know, I've got a supplier willing to offer me this equivalent product. Here, you know, you make sure it's equivalent. You get all the reports and the proper information. And, you know, it's I can get it faster. It'll save me time here. Can we use it? Okay, fantastic. Saves time, saves money. There's a variation in favor of your client. Tick. What about here? What about here? Will the builder even tell them? Will they even report it? Sometimes. Sometimes not. Anyway, they'll get you as your subby to tick off on it and they won't mention anything about the price to the to the um, client or they'll just you know not even get the subby to look at it. So, a single contractor is then appointed to manage the design, documentation and construction of the project. Essentially, it represents a package deal. Sounds good. This type of procurement allows a degree of innovation on aspects of the projects that are not fixed. The design team is appointed and contracted directly to the contractor from the start of the project. So you're working for the builder. You're not working for the end client or the end user even. So action to benefit good design. This is in, let's see what they're saying here. Support the client in seeking independent design advice. They're pu pu pushing themselves to ensure that the ambition of design quality and performance criteria are embedded within the brief. So they need to have thorough briefing. Can you imagine developers doing that to any great detail support the ability of the design team to deal directly with the client and associated units users okay that's that's like having your cake and eating it too it sounds good it sounds good but when as a designer working here he's my client the builder is my client i've got to represent his interests not his interests as much if he gives me a direction, I can't do it. it. Has to go through the builder. If the direction that they want to do, you know, is a, you know, breaches their contract, I need, you know, can't happen. So it's to do with the flow of communication. So here, you know, I, I see this all the time. This type of crap. I mean, particularly from older architects, more old-fashioned architects, and architects that have got well-established practices or you know when you get to ovg or government architect you've gone through the, the ringer for a while and they don't realize that you know you've got to keep the builder happy because they're your next source of work or you got half a million dollars worth of work lined up with them so it, it's quite difficult so often and it depends on who the builder is they may not even want you to talk to the client they want to manage it for you which in some circumstances can be really good because you can get some annoying clients so this isn't necessarily bad all the time i'm not saying that at all but it has the potential for a lot of risk, a lot of corner cutting, and not supervision. You know, not like the other example. So, seek independent design review at key project milestones, e.g. brief schematic design, design development. So, what they're suggesting here is they want you, the client to engage another architect to review the design at every stage. So, it's an additional cost. Do you think that happens? Support the contractor in selecting high-quality design consultants e.g. facilitate an expression of interest. Okay, I mean, yeah, good. That's another pipe dream. How many times have have uh, I've been approached by builders that have been going DNC and wanted me to just compete? And, you know, what was, what were we, a tiny firm of five people and we won jobs away from some of the biggest firms in the city. 
Seek additional contractual incentives to encourage Hall of Life, life and ESD performance. Okay. Include non-negotiable deliverables in the brief to ensure quality and delivery of key design features that have been signed off by stakeholders. Now, this is interesting because in the other one, in the traditional one, there is nothing is negotiable. If there's a change to the deliverables, if there's a change to the deliverables, then the contract sum changes. So if, if they remove a whole portion you know, or substitute something without approval, you get them to tear it up and replace it. Or you can know get a monetary return from but often you you want them to tear it up and replace it particularly with all the dodgy materials that we've got issues with so not recommended if the project is of special design interest or if there's uncertainty in the brief or the desired outcomes of the client yeah i mean that's a good point you you want it for maybe a luxury apartment tower on a reclaimed site would you think that's a special project? Would you? Require the completion of a design intent document before finalizing the contract and ensuring independent assessment of its achievements and associated rewards and penalties. I don't think I've ever seen a design intent document. Oh, I, yeah, I guess I have. I've seen some briefs and things, but the problem is all these people don't do it. So let's have a look at just two comparisons here. Here the example is for traditional pre-procurement. I'm sorry, I'm going all over the place. I need to make sure it still fits on my screen, guys. So this is a uh, school project, case study, uh, Susan Corey High School, Wirrabee. Susan Corey High School is a proposed purpose-built co-education. It's like uh, entry high school for a maximum of 800 students. Key design, adopted the projects. Okay, so asp aspirational brief. So what worked well, collaboration between the architects, PCG, and a smooth transition to the new principal, adequate budgeting, deliver project landscape work. So yeah, I mean, a school, it's a complicated project. There actually is a lot going in there. The cost of the project, $22 million. So there you go. There's, there's a, a example of it. Now let's look at what an example for a design and construct project is. A bypass infrastructure. Cost of the project, $27 million. So, a little bit different. A concise brief by Vic Rhodes as the client with a clear design aspiration for the project. So, this is where, when I say there are issues with procurement, I'm, I'm concerned with the significant use of design and construct for projects that it's not suited for because it, it gives, apparently, you know, the developers, the clients, and the banks prefer it's a reduced level of risk but it means the original people who were you know the police the certifiers the architects all of that who were here checking the builder are now all working for the builder even the certifiers privatized it's been privatized so yeah that, that i thought i'd give you a little bit of a rundown just of these two strategies and I'll, I'll go into more into greater detail um, but really th this just shows you the issue the issue with these two different ways of procuring buildings and I know this is targeted from a government perspective but it, it, it can all it can go over to developers and you know normal private sector it can be tough working in this environment it can work really well it can work really well depending on the project but you can often be asked to compromise to compromise you have to learn to say no and you have to learn to to um to risk losing work which can be tough which can be really tough thank you florian for going through that video what do you all think everyone if if a project was advertised as design and construct would that make a difference on if you would buy an apartment in it or if it was advertised traditional procurement if you were informed of what that meant would that make a difference as well i can see these as marketing suggestions now the solutions really the public needs to start demanding more and we have to realize the government only comes to the rescue after the fact the time the government steps in creates rules in in many ways it's just a theater it is the theater guys we now have access to information technology and you know, knowledge 
more than we ever did. So there's a little excuse for consumers to depend on big bad or you know big government to pat us on the head and take care of us. What do you reckon? As always, thank you for watching. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel. Let me know your thoughts and opinions on this one in the comments down below. If you're a fan and enjoy the content I create here, there are a few ways you can support us. You can join us on YouTube or Patreon. You can support us using our affiliate links at Amazon, eBay, Independent Reserve or Aussie Broadband. You can buy a merch from Heiser Says, use Gold Pass from the Perth Mint or support us via PayPal. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.